The Disrupt Education vlog can be found on YouTube. To hear it in podcast form, search Disrupt Education on any of the following podcast platforms. Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Breaker, CastBox, Overcast, Radio Public, Pocket Cast, Spotify, or Stitcher. Welcome to this episode of Disrupt Education. I've got a great guest today, Nyla Molu. Sorry, I got it. Yes, Nyla. Uh, Nyla is a um, energy and bioplastics researcher. Uh, she's a best-selling author. There's much more. And by the way, she's only 15. Uh, I'm going to leave that there for you. Uh, and uh, humbly say thank you, awesome, for being here on the uh, Disrupt Education podcast. Um, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Awesome. I know like there's a lot of levels underneath uh, <laughs> being the researcher, being an author, uh, looking at uh, a lot of different education paths, but tell us a little bit more about who you are. Yeah. Uh, so I'm really passionate about making impact in the world, specifically in the sustainability sector. Uh, and this was kind of the year when I thought, I know I do want to make impact at some point in my life, drive change. Uh, so why am I waiting to start building in you know five years down the line, 10 years down the line? And so this year, I started delving pretty deeply into energy. Uh, and I did a little bit with fusion and then with solar. And I designed these transparent and flexible solar cells, leveraging nanomaterials that I'm now building out in a lab. And recently, I started also researching bioplastics and trying to build a better bioplastic that is both biodegradable uh, and inexpensive from duckweed. So I'm doing an internship with Pond right now in that area. Uh, and then, like you mentioned I also really love to write so my first novel was released a few months ago and now I'm working on a sequel wow okay so <laughs> every parent right now is questioning their own parenting they're like okay so because uh, myself I have a teen um how how did all this begin where where did the the science the the energy and education um learning about all this what was the spark there Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was a lot, a combination of things. So for one thing, it was just my family and the environment that I grew up in. So this, it was always pushed, like do whatever makes you happy and also helps others. And so I was very curious from a young age, always trying to learn. And then within school, I was really interested in the sciences. And I remember in grade five, we did this energy project and I actually did geothermal, which I'm not doing anything with today, but I do remember just being super interested in that. And so I think in September, last September, that's when I really started building projects within the field and doing something with my curiosity. Because I think the best thing you can do when you're interested in something is to take it to that next level, actually building and applying your knowledge. Um, and so I joined a student accelerator program called the Knowledge Society. And that really did help to accelerate uh, my, my project building and exploring those, those curiosities. Outside of uh, your path, so you're also writing, so there had to be something there. It's like, I love to write. So we're going to, let's just do a quick transfer here from science to writing. Is right. it the same? Was it just like, hey, I love to write? Or what, what kind of spurred you to write? Uh, and now your second book. Yeah, uh, I think that stemmed from my love for reading. And so there were always a lot of books in my house. And I remember like my dad would always be reading us stories. And I loved these different plot lines. And I loved falling in love with characters. And I thought, you know, if so many books are out there, so many people can write books, why can't I write my own book? Uh, and it started actually just with stories. I would just write these short stories and I was submitting them to contests here and there. And then that extended to chapter books. And then novels. And from a very young age, I did have the goal of becoming a published author. And I wanted to get my own book out there. It was in grade six when I started going through the entire process of getting a professional editor and querying these agents and publishing houses. That that time I just got mass rejected on that book. But then uh, I took those learnings. I went through the process again. I wrote another book. Um, and then that's the one I got a contract for in grade eight. So. 
I can't imagine what like so I've tried to write a book a couple of times and here you are in sixth grade already being rejected but still taking those <laughs> learnings that's amazing um, so tell tell me about um, and and the listeners about like your educational path um, you know is it traditional is it not traditional um, are you like in school what kind of school or how do you how do you learn how do you learn these things uh, so I am in school and I think school has played a really great role in my life. Life. I've always loved school. Um, and so I think, like I said, like the STEMs always, the STEM areas really stood out to me. But then also, really, just all the subjects I enjoyed. Um, and so I do do that. But I feel like before, like in the past years, I've gone really hard at school unnecessarily. So, uh, you know, when studying for tests, for example, just go really hard and just repetitively regurgitate the same information over and over and over again, even if I already knew it, I would just keep studying. And it was honestly kind of a waste of my time. Uh, and so when I joined TCAS, I started reprioritizing. And that's when I saw like, I could be building these projects, I could be doing this research into these things that really interest me. And that doesn't mean like leaving school behind and stopping studying for those tests. It just means allotting my time in different ways and doing things that make sense for me. And so I was a part of some clubs just for the sake of being a part of them. Um, because you know, being a part of clubs, that's considered great. But sometimes it's not always a aligned with what you're interested in. And so I started really uh, just reevaluating that side of things and still doing things within school, of course, but also spending a lot more of my time on my projects. And that brought me a lot more value. I felt like I was becoming a lot smarter through working on these kinds of things outside of school. Um, and it, it was really fun as well. So it wasn't just like working all the time because uh, doing this research is, is super fun if it's in areas that you enjoy. I can't imagine being like your chemistry teacher in high school, just like, you go ahead and teach. I, I don't know, like, what are those classes like? I mean, are, are you are you advanced in them? Are you looking at like, are you just helping others? Or is it new knowledge to you? Or is it just kind of check the box? And you could be totally honest, because we're disrupting education today. <laughs> yeah, um, I think school for me, I mean, I'm in grade nine, so I feel like it starts probably getting more difficult in grade 11 and 12. I'm going to be doing IV, so uh, that'll probably look really different. School for me right now, it's not like it's not too difficult, and I don't really put any time towards school anymore outside of school. Uh, again, that's <laughs> going to change grade 11. I don't think I can do that in grade 11, but at least like in grade nine, I would just do my stuff in class and then I would go and work on my own stuff outside of class. And that seemed to work pretty well for me. Got it. Got it. So very um, time boxing. You, you've already figured out how to really manage your time well as well. There's so many skills in here I'm seeing. I just want to, I can't wait to show this to, to some of my uh, classes um, in career. Um, so all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question here about like so if if you're a student and you want to find different resources even outside of your school because we know like there are some limited things that schools can do right so you found different different things that are a lot more project based outside of school that kind of dive into their interests we have a lot of parents and a lot of students actually and even some educators that are interested in how do I connect people with those types of things. How did, how did you find that? How did you find the Stanford piece? How did you find um, all these different things that you can do outside of school? I would say biggest resource to take advantage of is people. I mean, don't take advantage of people, but uh, like, <laughs> like, like do uh, reach out to a bunch of different people. That has really helped me networking. Um, and so when I got LinkedIn, I realized that there is an abundant amount of people that you can reach out to. And there are experts in these different fields and not all of them will respond to you. But like, if you read a really cool paper and you want to know more about it, you can reach out to one of those authors and again might not respond but if they do then you can gain so much value from that and that's played a really crucial role for me and from that has stemmed things like mentorship where you go on weekly meetings that's been really uh really valuable for my solar energy projects that's how i'm building it out in a lab i'm working alongside my mentor um and so a lot of opportunities can arise from networking a lot of value to be learned so if you're starting for example in quantum computing, that's super 
super interesting to you, you want to start building projects, there are people dedicating their entire lives to quantum computing who will be willing to help someone um, working in their field at a younger age because some people really do like to see that. And so um, really being open to that, getting out of your comfort zone, embracing Bross mentality and, and networking will get you a lot of cool things. That's uh, wow. Like, okay, yes, thank you. Um, what I'm thinking though is, you know, one of the things that I work with a lot of you is, 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 you know, unlearning the fact that you have to wait, right? And I love the question that you asked yourself. You're like, why can't I do this now? You know, let's go. Um, let's go to LinkedIn and, and networking. Networking is, is difficult for young, young people, uh, a lot of young people, uh, but it doesn't have to be. Well, how, how did you start on LinkedIn and, and kind of what advice would you give somebody uh, it's it's kind of, you know, right now, I mean, you've already connected with a, a ton of people um, and it's probably second nature. But when you were starting, what were the first couple of things that you did after you created your, your LinkedIn? Well, in terms of reaching out to people, just like be honest with them. You don't have to pretend like you know so much and you're an expert in this field. You're like a mini genius. You can just talk to them and be like, you know, this is a really interesting field to me. What you're doing is super inspirational. Um, can I grab like 20 minutes of your time? Um, and sometimes they, they will say yes. I think like at the beginning, I had less of a hit, right? Like less people would respond. As you build up your profile, then you gain more legitimacy to a certain degree and then more people will begin responding. But there definitely were people who were really helpful at the beginning as well. Um, and so just finding these fields that you are interested in and reaching out to people, that is a great way to start. And so the greatest way to start is just to start because uh, otherwise, you know, you have to, you know, you have to make your LinkedIn and then you start reaching out to people. You have to get in your following. You have to like make a profile and that can sound um, like hard and, you know, uh, not, not the best right now in hindsight. But uh, when you do start, then there's so much you can gain from that and so much value that can come out of it. So that, that would be my biggest tip uh just just reaching out to people and being honest about why you're reaching out oh fantastic advice i love that um and yes it does work um it is working for you um uh, and also what i've heard you say was a lot of and and we were talking about it i think on another forum but um project-based learning right like doing yeah. getting your hands dirty so this is the big disrupt education question then the the question is all right, so you're seeing, you know, self-driven versus traditional. Um, you're nine through ninth grade here in, are you in the States? I'm in Canada. In Canada, okay, so similar, uh, North America. Um, and what do you do? What, what would you change seeing as a user of education, which I love, um, you're, you're a customer, but you're also a driver of new knowledge. What do you change? What are some of the big things that you change in education? Right now, I think there's so much emphasis on grades and school has created this entire narrative around failure. And we think failure is a really bad thing because we consider failure under 50%. When in the real world, when you want to go and tackle these big issues, like if you want to play a role in stopping climate change, um, like there is going to be failure and there are going to be roadblocks. And a lot of people are scared of that because of this entire narrative. And so changing that to me looks like having a lot more project-based learning. Um, and tests, I, I do see the value of tests, but even shifting more to assignments would be a good idea to me because for tests, again, people are just like cramming, um, they're regurgitating information and then they go and forget. Whereas if it's an assignment where you can perhaps intersect your different interests, then that could be um, really cool. So so in biology, if you're doing uh, uh, assignment on ecosystems and you get to go and actually build something and then you're actually applying your knowledge and you're probably going to take away so much more from that experience than spending 40 minutes stressfully writing a test. <laughs> uh, and so I think that just project based learning, that shift is going to be really crucial in the future. What is your favorite project that you've learned from? 
Uh, I think my favorite project would be working on my solar cell because uh, it's something I've been working on for quite a while now and it's been so much fun, so interesting, although of course there have been a lot of roadblocks and I was reading some papers on solar this morning because I'm trying to figure out my conducting electrode and there are like so many big words and it's just a little bit overwhelming sometimes it's like oh my gosh I don't know what this means but understanding it is okay to not know and there's also like fun in it because there's more to figure out. Uh, there's a lot that we don't know about a lot of things um, and really like taking pride in learning instead of focusing on what you don't know. Uh, like focus on going and learning the things that you don't know. Uh, and so yeah, I've learned a, a ton from that project. I've met a lot of cool people and um, I'm going to be building it out like along my, along my mental uh, as I told you, and so that's going to be an incredible experience, I'm sure, on its own, working in a lab. Haven't really done that before, especially on my own design, and so I'm really looking forward to it. Fantastic. I got to ask then, as as a youth, say you have, okay, so my son is 16, uh, my daughter's 13, right around that age, right? What kind of advice do you give them right now as youth in learning? I would say start exposing yourself to different fields, especially within emerging technologies that a lot of people don't know about. So that's things like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, BCIs, start exposing yourself and, you know, doing courses and looking at YouTube videos and see what makes you interested. And then take that um, network with people in these fields and start like writing your own articles, making your own videos, uh, producing your own content. And from there, a lot of ideas will arise. So then actually building a project, your own project, that is going to make you learn so much. And if you do that in a variety of different fields, then you really become unstoppable because that's where you become a polymath, where you have really strong skill sets in a variety of different areas. And then when you go into something where one person may only look at it through the lens of one topic, you have all these things. Um, you have all these areas of expertise that you can now intersect to make ideas that just have never been thought of before. Outstanding, outstanding. Um, I'm so giddy because I'm a high school teacher and I'm like, man, I wish you were in one of my classes. Um, oh my but um, I will tell you this then. So let's ask, so where can people where can people find your book? And, and you have another one coming. Um, and where can people connect with you? Because I'm going to guess after this, there's going to be a lot of people who are like, yeah, I need to talk to her. She's got oh like God. some really good ideas and, and uh, there's obviously opportunities in this. So uh, how can people connect with Nyla? Well, in terms of connecting with me, LinkedIn is my go-to, so feel free to connect there. Uh, I have Twitter. I'm not as active on it, but you can also find like more of my work on my website, just nylamalia.com, and subscribe to my newsletter if you want to see more monthly updates. And then with regards to the book, that's available um, in basically every online bookstore, um, in-store and a few, uh, but I think in like globally amazon is a place that we all share so yeah what let's give a little uh outline of what your first book is and what your second book is i don't think we uncovered that so what what are the books what uh what are their titles and and what are they about so the first book is called chronicles of illusions the blue wild and it is a fantasy fantasy uh magical realism book about these two girls traveling through this ancient athenium three chronicles uh to retrieve an artifact from each and they only have five days Days in each book and if they stay any longer they become these characters but um, when they leave they have to like taking that artifact kills all these characters in the books and so they're telling themselves that they're merely illusions when they do have feelings and one of the girls falls in love with one of the characters and there's this kind of drama uh, so that's uh, a little bit about what the first book is about and then the second book actually the title I might be changing so I can't give a definite title there uh, but it's kind of just um, um, a leeway from from the first book so I won't give too much away yeah. no I love it you got to pe keep people on edge um, that's amazing and uh, yeah I, I wish you well with that we'll put up the information in the uh, notes for people to uh, check those out um, very very cool how did you learn to fail? Like, how did you learn that failure was okay? I think I learned to fail through failing because <laughs> failure is super scary and it doesn't feel great in the moment. Not 
like I, I can talk about failure, but even when I do fail, it, I'm not like, oh my gosh, yes. I mean, it should be, but it's not always how it is. And I think my first real moment of failure was with that first book because I just had an influx of rejections in my inbox that I was like waking up to in the morning. Um, and so I had to like, I had this goal of becoming published and I had to get past that. And I, I said like, you know, this, this does suck. This isn't my expected outcome, but I'm going to take that. It's going to motivate me, motivate me further. Um, and I'm still going to reach this goal that I do have. And then through that, I did learn how to fail. I learned how to persevere and I took those skill sets into my STEM building. And there's definitely a lot of failures there and being okay with that is very important as well. So like with bioplastics, I was researching algae for a good few months. And then I realized like, just not going to work. Not going to work. I have to pivot to a different feedstock source. And that is okay. You know, there's excitement in pivoting. Uh, so being okay with that as well. Amazing. I see a script here and, you know, maybe a movie. I'm just saying, I'm going to give you that. <laughs> so I'll, you heard it here first on Disrupt Education. Nyla, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story, um, your ideas, uh, your, your perspective on education. Um, you are an amazing young person and I cannot wait to see what comes next for you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And to you all, thank you so much for listening. Until next time on Disrupt Education.